Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Today I am back with my next installment of the Advanced Crystalline Conflict series. This time we are showcasing my favorite job, the Monk, one of the less played melee roles, which can bring so much to every fight. Thanks for clicking on today's video, and with no more delays, let's get into it. Before diving into Crystalline Conflict, there are a few combos you are going to want to learn in order to maximize your potential in any match. To begin, we have the main 7-part combo rotation. You are aiming to burn through this in order to reach your 7th ability, the Phantom Rush. Commit this icon to memory. You also want to commit both the Rising Phoenix and the Enlightenment to memory. Learning these frees are a must in order to do well on the Monk outside of your Limit Break. Your first combo to learn is the Rising Enlightenment. This can be lethal in the opening battle. Once your team engage a single target, use your Thunderclap to close the gap. Follow with the Six-Sided Star in order to stun, and position yourself behind the target. Remember to use the Rising Phoenix first for the bonus 50% damage on your next weapon skill, then using Enlightenment to launch that target into your team. This almost always results in an early pick, which can then lead into a complete steamroll. Do not forget that Enlightenment can be used to knock players into environmentals and away from health packs, and to generally isolate targets away from their team. Your second combo to learn is the Rising Phantom Rush. This is where learning the icons come in useful, as you will need to burn through the first six main rotation combo actions to gain access. Used following a Rising Phoenix, the Phantom Rush deals a heavy 18,000 damage. Powerful burst damage causes the player to panic, and will force them to burn through their MP resources. This combo works wonders even against tanks. A good tank can stall for a long time. With good use of your burst combos, you will chew through any tanks in seconds. Taking these combos further, once Phantom Rush is ready, dive your target with the Thunderclap. Rising Phoenix into Phantom Rush, stunned with the Six-Sided Star, into the Rising Phoenix Enlightenment Knockback combo. Should your target survive, they will be in a very bad situation. They will burn for their entire MP resource in order to survive, and must retreat from the battle, if a teammate has not spotted them first in order to finish them off. You can also instantly dash back in to keep the pressure going. Not many jobs will outrun the monk. If you are looking to kill any target, you want to repeat the previous combo. Then watch your enlightenment. The moment the knockback takes effect, instantly use your Meteo Dive, ending the burst rotation with a huge additional 32,000 damage. You can of course throw Riddle of Earth into the mix during any combo, as following with Earth's Reply deals 25% of the compiled damage you took to your target, and will heal for 50% of that compiled damage. I personally tend to use this more when we are up in a team fight. In a battle, I know we are going to win, otherwise I try to use this defensively. When forced to flee, oftentimes huge amounts of damage come your way, or while someone chases you down. That extra burst damage and heal can really catch your stalker off guard. The Opening Battle I always say this is the most important stage in Crystalline Conflict, as the first engagement sets up the pace for the entire match. Now I have gone through this pain for you, across many matches. I tested being the first to engage and tested holding back. Being the first into battle, while a few times it was possible to create an opening for the team, first into battle as the monk always ends in a fast death. Following those engages, I did win all but one game. However, losing that opening battle made turning the match much more difficult. Matches were lasting anywhere up to 10 minutes and were very close games. Now as tempting as it is to dive in as the monk, your patience will be rewarded. Never be the first in. You are actually looking to position yourself towards the back. Hold strong. You are waiting for either the enemy to make the first move, at which point you waste no time diving onto them, or holding until your team picks out a single target, at which point you also dive in, with your enlightenment to knock them in further. Changing from being the first to engage, not only did I have a 100% win rate, we won every single opening battle. This allowed for the monk to do what he does best. Not only will your limit break be ready, you can now take many more 1v1s, picking off stragglers and those who trickle in without grouping up. 
and diving backlines dividing them further. A good opening battle sets panic, misplays and lack of coordination. All things you can take advantage of. Winning these opening battles, every match was anywhere from 3 to 5 minutes at most. Play the opening battle with restraint, looking for opportunities, and you will find much more success. As the monk, you have many strategies available to you. I will talk you through some scenes and explain my thought process during each and every one of them, starting with my own rules of not engaging first, or until someone selects a target beforehand. I notice their poor samurai being targeted by my backline. A follow-up dive from both myself and our gunbreaker very quickly dispatched him from battle. Now we are one up. We want to keep up the pressure. Seeing the warrior use his chaotic cyclone, I now know he has much less self-sustained capability. I take this time to work through my combos, ready for some heavy hits. Together with the team, he burnt through his entire MP resources and dropped quickly after. Their white mage makes an attempt to stall, and I waste no time piling on in. The moment he guards up, I switch all of my attention to the enemy's monk. Catching him off guard with some well-timed support from the team, he dies without any chance to react. At this point, the samurai has returned, the samurai is already panicking and ends up feeding. A great outcome as he is barely halfway to his game-flipping limit break. This next part shows just how beneficial a good opening battle influences a match. Paying close attention to their machinist, I notice he goes for the limit break. I tank the shot and immediately dash away an elixir back to full. This is a solid outcome, as that was a heavy misplay by the machinist. And with them already being a player down, I am now free to take the 1v1 and bully the machinist away from the objective. While taking the 1v1, I am always checking over at the objective, and with some clever positioning and good use of stun, I steal not one, but two health packs from the machinist, resulting in myself having full MP resources, including my limit break, leaving us free up in the team fight, leading into an easy win. Check this round out. Again on Palestria, I begin by positioning myself to the side, ready for a potential flank. I get dived by the ninja, however I am not too worried as it is a pretty even matchup. I take the fight to build a limit break, all while keeping my eye towards the objective. You may notice that the white mage is in a pretty rough spot, and as soon as the ninja dips, I waste no time to help secure that kill. Now that we are ahead in the team fight, I can begin to look to apply pressure and search for those 1v1s. I almost snag an easy kill on the machinist, however I retreat to help my backline deal with the flanking ninja. We have the advantage, and want to aim to maintain that. Monk's movement is ideal, to help your squishies whenever you can. Now is my time to really hard focus a player. In this situation, I chose the machinist. They can be scary powerful, when they are left to do what they like. And with their team comp, killing or keeping them busy, pushes the advantage even further. This is where I play with a lot more caution. They will soon have free respawning, which could easily overwhelm me. I elixir up for the maximum MP, and I play using corners and line of sight to my advantage, all while being ready to steal the health kit that the range jobs so desperately rely on. Then going from target to target to apply pressure forces them to guard or retreat. We keep the same momentum going from winning that first opening battle. Adding the right amount of divide and conquer, the enemy team was never able to successfully group up in order to make a comeback, resulting in a rather fast win. This should hopefully give you some ideas as to the strategies you can apply as a monk. You are rewarded for both your creativity and flexibility. If you find yourself having trouble, slow things down. Patience is good to learn as the monk. Let others make mistakes you can capitalize on. Save focus in single targets until you either win the opening battle or have the target completely singled out from his team. Manage your positioning. 
Natural cover is your best friend, and when possible, stay in range of your back row. Shutting down flankers going for your squishies can be the difference in a win or a loss. And lastly, use your limit break well. Your charge time is wonderful, so do not be afraid to use it. If you're going for a fast finish, make sure your enemy has less than one-fourth of their remaining health, or until their guard is up. Blind alting half health and above targets will rarely get you results. If you're aiming for the big alt damage of 32,000, be sure to use the big combo beforehand, shown earlier in the video. Knowing your matchups will help influence your strategies. Let's begin with the tanks. First, the Paladin. If there was ever a tank that forces long teamfights, it's the Paladin. Combat-wise, there is very little one can do to you. And with your powerful burst damage, you can burn them down and force out their limit break with great ease. The Gunbreaker. While both mobile and powerful, does not have the same escape potential as the Monk. The damage to health ratio makes this matchup rather even. However, a Monk is a Gunbreaker's worst nightmare. Crowd control have no effect on a Gunbreaker's limit break. Stuns, sleep, bind, you name it, the limit break continues. However, saving your knockback ready for the Gunbreaker's limit break will knock them away from your team, essentially shutting down their best battle-turning ability. The Warrior. While powerful, they have a relatively slow attack rate. Their pull and stun can be a nuisance. Keeping calm and playing through their abilities, you can heavily burn through their self-sustain. However, respect the power of the Warrior's limit break. Do this and the Monk can play through the Warrior very well. And last up for the tanks, we have the Dark Knight. In a 1v1, there is not much they can do. Pulling you in and diving only brings you into the 1v1. Your damage and dash shielding allows you to outlast them. Only when a Dark Knight trades health for damage do the fights become much more scary. However, that cost to health and MP just makes your job easier. Their limit rate works as an amazing stall. However, with your burst, you can force them to use it early in an attempt to survive. For the melee DPS, let's begin with the Monk Mirror Match. Simply put, these 1v1s come down to the more experienced Monk, who understands his combos. If both Monks are unsure on how to use their combos against one another, these 1v1s end up in a stalemate, until the less stubborn player finally backs off. Dragoons, the melee king themselves. This is a matchup of skill. You're looking for the Dragoon's backflip, to then either break line of sight, or to instantly close the gap. In doing so, you remove a large portion of their burst rotation. Surviving through their burst rotation gives you the advantage, as Dragoons will have some downtime. If you have not been hit by Horrid Roar, they will still be suffering 25% bonus damage from you from their Gear Skogul. Following their burst rotation, get in close and do some damage. The Reaper has a terrifying burst combo rotation, dropping you so fast there is zero chance of survival. However, with the difference in burst availability, as the Monk, you will almost never come across this. Dive Reapers after portaling in, and don't damage into their Arcane Crest. Not playing into their Arcane Crest healing, the Monk will power through a Reaper with great ease. The Samurai is hard-hitting, but suffer the same slow rotation as the Warriors. Staying calm and playing through their crowd control leaves you with more than enough resources to best the Samurai. Keep track of when their Limit Break is ready. From that point on, never attack into their Cheat Ten. Ignore them until the timer expires. Once their Cheat Ten expires, Feel free to dive in and completely burn down that samurai. Last up for the mini rolls, we have the ninja. This will be your hardest matchup. They lack the burst potential to drop you. However, they have more than enough resistances to survive you. You're aiming to burn through their ninjutsus. If they are trying to survive you, they won't be double stunning your teammates. Once a ninja is limit break ready, you must keep your health above 50% to avoid that one shot. Oftentimes when fighting a ninja, you are only doing so to build ult and keep their attention. The Bard, a great supporting role which can apply buffs to the team. Thanks to your free dashes, you can very easily keep pressure on them. With some hard-hitting combos, catching a Bard alone, and keeping them from health packs, there is really nothing Bards can do to stop a Monk from full-on focusing them. You not only force a DPS from battle, you also deprive the enemy team of strong power buffs. The Machinist, even as the Monk, Machinists have a scary burst combo potential. Keeping your health high is a must. Respecting their power, and slowly pushing through their abilities give you the edge. Caught out alone, a machinist must burn through their powerful combos in an attempt to survive. They can knock you back, but thanks to your free dashes, you won't be gone for long. This gives you the free reign to stick to them until you get the kill or an easy limit break charge. The Dancer is the only job more mobile than yourself. They are your ranged variant. You want to dive in, get some damage done, and pressure them out. Do not overcommit to the chase. 
as not only will they outmaneuver you, they can easily bait you into a bad spot. Dive in following CC or CC them yourself and use your enlightenment to fire them towards your team. A dancer's hard-hitting AoE is their honing dance. Wait until they come close spinning around. This is your best chance to burn them down, as during this time a dancer cannot flee. Black mages are pure powerhouses. You must respect their damage. Not paying attention will earn you a very fast death. Look for when they are isolated to get up in their face. Using your enlightenment, you can then push them away from allies they could escape to. Keep track of your MP as the damage matchup is fairly even. Back out and reset if you must. The Summoner. They specialize in their AoE damage. Against the monk who is a 1v1 specialist, you will always make fast work of them. They have no means of evade, and their limit break is none too threatening with high health and MP resources. You can never go wrong with singling out a summoner, or easy kills to obtain that team advantage. A red mage is the slippery black mage. While not as deadly in terms of raw power, they can still deal insane amounts of damage at both close and long range. Their silence is lethal if you are caught out in the open, and can very easily use their dash to escape. Play the long game, force out their cooldowns. A red mage without their silence or their evade will be unable to survive for very long. For the supports, let's kick things off with the white mage. You must respect their miracle of nature. Getting transformed turns you into a free kill. The additional shielding and healing they can provide does a great job at outlasting your burst rotation. Aim to burn through some of their MP and abilities before going full combo. Doing so leaves the white mage with nothing. They either die, barely survive, or end up panic orting early. In the opening battle, wait out the miracle of nature before committing to diving them. The Astrologian. A lot weaker on damage, with some annoying crowd control. Their true worth comes in their limit break, granting a huge power boost to their team while lowering your team. One of the best plays is to close the gap, stun them, then fire them into your team. Wiping Astros early give you more time before facing their powerful limit break. Once their limit break is up, unless your team are still slaying, flee, give them space and wait it out. You'll find entire teams will burn through their burst rotation during an Astro's limit break, opening the perfect chance for your own. The Scholar, notably a hard class to kill. When possible, you want to be up in their face. Force them to burn through their shield on themselves. In doing so, you remove so much value the Scholar brings to their team. If they are too busy trying to escape you, they can't be applying damage over time to your team and respect their mummification. Then back out should you get caught in one. Their ability to drop your healing output can easily get you killed, especially when you are there in their backline with the enemy team turning to kill you. And last up the Sage, a very powerful class with the ability to place an immortal zone for his team. You have both the mobility and the damage advantage, and you are the perfect class to deal with their limit break. You can step within the ring and out DPS them through the tick damage. Also thanks to enlightenment, you can knock them out of their own limit break, giving them no value and turning them into a potential free kill. And there we have it. Everything you need to know in order to pick up the monk. And with time and experience, you shall improve even further. Happy hunting, and I shall see you all in the next one.